Yeah, thanks everyone for joining the webinar today. So I'm Dan and I'm gonna be taking you through uh, peaks for ion mobility data analysis. Now, yeah, most of my expertise is in actually using the software. So a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about today is different features in the software that I think are useful for you to actually use peaks for ion mobility data. But first I'll just go through some slides to actually lay the groundwork for the, the different parts uh, or lay the groundwork for what ion mobility is and the different formats of ion mobility that can be loaded into peaks and what they're useful for. All right, yeah, so just a quick overview of what I'll be talking about today. So three main points, just the different eye mobility methods, um, the, fe the algorithm features in peaks that are actually valuable to eye mobility. And then where I'm gonna be spending most of my time is in the, the actual software demo. All right, so first of all, I'd like to talk a little bit about FAMES. So this is the brand of ion mobility that's provided by Thermo. And theirs is quite different from what, what other ion mobility variations are available. So what they use is something called compensation voltage, where they switch between different voltages to see to pick up different types of peptides based on their ion mobility. So that, that's what this figure here is trying to demonstrate. So with this type of ion um, compensation voltage, they're picking up the uh, orange peptides. And then, then with this compensation voltage, they're picking up the blue peptides, which if you were to look at it in a traditional mass spec experiment, those two would be overlapped in terms of their actual M over Z and you wouldn't actually be able to get MS2 scans from each of those. So then in this figure here, um, in this experiment, they grabbed a whole bunch of different um, compensation voltages, but the recommended way, and this is how I would actually recommend doing it in peaks, is to pick a few that are going to give you a, a different set of peptides, like what you see here. And then the end result of that is you get different peptides with some overlap between them. So the idea behind this, and uh, so this data can be loaded into peaks no matter how you actually do it in the, in the latest version. So you can actually bring in a data set where it actually contains different compensation voltages in the same raw file and peaks will pick that up and give you the actual compensation voltage details, build a nice Venn diagram if possible, and give the result to you. The, the main thing that you end up getting from this type of experiment is it's sort of like an in mass spec type of fractionation where you're gonna get a wider range of peptides than you normally would get with the same amount of machine time. And that's generally what we're trying to do with FAMES. All right, so now let's talk about Bruker's brand of ion mobility, which is using uh, the TIMS and Passive. So I'll talk a little bit about the, the details of that. So, so it starts off with the same problem of what happens when you have a group of peptides that have a similar M over Z um, coming out at a similar retention time how are you actually able to separate that? So what happens with the TIMS and PASSIVE is that you isolate those peptides that have a similar M over Z all together at the same time. And if you were at, to actually do a traditional massivic experiment, you'd basically just grab one of those, do some fragmentation and get a spectrum from it. But with the PASSIVE, that's a parallel accumulation spectral fragmentation, what it will do is it will quickly go through and grab each of those based on their um, eye mobility. So for example, grab here the red one, fragment it, give you a spectrum, grab the yellow one, 
fragment it, give you a spectrum, and so on. And by doing that, you're able to get a whole bunch of MS2 spectra that you normally wouldn't be able to get. So you're getting more spectra from a, a small amount of sample. All right, so that's the, the idea behind it. How does that actually come into play in peaks? Because I'm going to zoom in here on this first figure here. And this, I like to spend a little bit of time on this part. So what you see here is you get the details of what's actually coming out of the mass spec. So the blue here is the peptide features as we call them. So signal coming from the mass spec in terms of the LCMS, uh, what actually looks like a peptide. So you can see here, in terms of the detected peptide features, you can see that you have a large amount of detected peptide features here in the gray, but only a fraction of those are actually selected for MS2. And that's generally the problem that you, that you get with mass, with mass spec, especially if you're using um, data dependent a data dependent method is that you're only getting a small fraction of what is potentially actually there. These are these are just peptide features. Um, so that you get a fraction of what's actually targeted for MSMS and then a, a, a fraction of that is then identified. So this is what I'm gonna be focusing on a lot about today is how to actually look at not only what's identified but also what is potentially identifiable, and then also the peptide features that aren't even selected for MS2. Um, so I'm gonna talk about that in terms of, uh, the, the main data set that I'm gonna be working with today is a, a DIA data set to show what you could do with that, with a library search. Um, but um, a lot of this stuff can be seen in DDA experiment, that sort of thing too. Yeah, so, yeah, and then with um, a Tim Stoff, you're then able to uh, detect a whole bunch of peptide features. And this is just showing you what's actually targeted for MS2, and then we're able to get a good fraction of that for identification. Right, and I'd just like to uh, point out um, Waters method for ion mobility as well. Um, so their brand name for the type of actual instrumentation that they use for this is, is called TriWave. And the idea behind this is that they actually bring in, as shown by the different colors of, of the circles here, all the different ions into the instrument at once that have a similar M over Z and retention time. And they separate them out by ion mobility using these waves that travel through that chamber of the actual instrument and separate them out by their ion mobility and shoot them through to get MSMS one at a time. So similar thing to the others um, where it's actually just separating things by their ion mobility in order to get more MS2 of the spectra that would be overlapped if you're using a different method. All right, yeah, and I'd just like to mention that that all those types of uh, eye mobility data can now be loaded into Peaks in uh, Peaks X Pro without any need of any extra converters or work beforehand. Those, you can just bring that data directly into Peaks and it will run through without any problems. All right, so what, in terms of Peaks, how does it actually help with ion mobility data? So, one of the big things about PEAKS is its ability to detect peptide features. So what do I mean by a peptide feature? I'll, uh, well, I'll just run through all these first and I'll go through them step by step. So what I'm gonna talk about today is our, our peptide feature detection, um, our four different um, algorithms that can be used for identification. And I'll talk a little bit about our new thing, which is our spectral library search. And I'll talk about in terms of the quantification because that's when it actually becomes important is during our quantification. And a lot of the improvements that we made in Peaks X Pro 
have to do with the accuracy of our quantification and avoiding missing values. Um, because with iron mobility data, the main point is that you're trying to expand the amount of coverage that you're getting from uh, at the identification level and the quantification level, which increases the chance of getting missing values from some of your samples. So in our algorithm, we've put a lot of work into avoiding those missing values. All right, so let's just talk a little bit about what, what I mean by peptide features and peptide feature detection. So a peptide coming out of a mass spec is going to have a certain shape across the retention time or over the ion mobility dimension. And it's gonna have a certain isotopic distribution along the M over Z dimension shown here. So you have a certain um, distribution of the isotopes of that peptide coming out and it's gonna have a certain shape across the retention time or the iron mobility dimension. So that's, as a software, as an algorithm, if, if you have that type of distribution, you can work with that. So, so what Peaks does, without looking at the MS2 or anything like that beforehand, when you load your data in, it looks at that LCMS distribution and says, okay, what from this data actually looks like a peptide to me? And it will do that with the, every, the whole set of data and go through and say, okay, it'll draw this shape around what it believes to be a peptide feature. Say, okay, I think this is possibly a peptide. But then you start to get into the actual problems of dealing with this, which from a human eye is, is uh, quite easy to see, but from a software perspective becomes quite difficult. Uh, so what happens if you have different peptides that are overlapping with each other um, in the um, data? So especially with ion mobility, this becomes quite difficult because you're looking in four different dimensions. You're looking in the mass over charge, you're looking in the retention, you're looking in the um, intensity, and you're looking in the ion mobility dimensions. So you're going to end up getting a lot of overlap. So I won't get into too much of the details, but the main point is here is that Peaks is able to deconvolute those peptide features and isolate the individual ones that it believes to be peptide features quite well. And that's what I'm showing here. Yeah, so um, just one of the things that I'd like to point out here. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna grab my pen. Maybe I'll just do a stamp here. That's spotlight, draw. Yeah, so one of the things in so here one of the this is one of the features that gets overlooked is the lcms heat map and it can be useful for uh, troubleshooting your data and figuring out what was identified what wasn't and looking at the the broader picture of the actual mass spec data so if you then click on this um, IMMS button here. You can then get a zoomed in picture of that where it will actually give you this retention time window, but actually show the IM mobility details of that as well. And yeah, I'll go through that a little bit when we actually get into the software demo. Okay. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the actual algorithms that are used in Peaks here. So when it comes to eye mobility data, it comes back to that whole idea that we're just trying to get the most out of our sample as possible. So Peaks uses uh, four different algorithms to search your data. It does de novo sequencing, uh, PeaksDB, which is our traditional uh, database search, uh, Peaks PTM, which is able to find um, all of the naturally occurring um, modifications all at once without you having actually to select like a certain subset of 10 uh, variable PTMs. 
And then you have spider, which is good at finding uh, point mutations. So one of the views that's new in, in some of the later versions of Peaks is this uh, peptide feature-based view. So coming back to that whole idea of uh, peptide features, it'll assign each of those peptide features an ID and give you all the information from that that's possible. So you can have your identification from the database here. So you'll notice that you have your database hits with your, your minus 10 log P score, and that could be from PeaksDB, PeaksVTem, or Spider. But what this view also gives you is it gives you the de novo details here as well. So if you have a good quality de novo result, it will show that here too. And even if it's unidentifiable, you can even see that here in this view as well. In the software demo, I'll go through how to actually navigate through this view and see everything that's going on with your data. Because here's where you can see all the details that you want. It gives you the IM mobility data, the area of that uh, peptide feature, the quality of it, and all these types of details. All right, so that's the general view of, of peaks and how it can be used for any, any type of biomobility data. Uh, now I'm gonna switch gears and talk a little bit about uh, the data independent analysis and why it can be good for biomobility. So I have this comparison here. Um, there, uh, the data sets aren't completely comparable. They're run by two different labs and things like that. But the, the main point that I'm trying to get here is a missing value percentage without any ID transfer. So this is, but, and I'll get into what ID transfer is later on. Um, so the main point here is with data independent analysis, you can avoid missing values from the actual mass spec data. And the idea is with, with um, data independent analysis, no matter what brand uh, you're using, the whole idea is to get a wider mass window so that you don't miss any peptides. You're not picking different uh, masses to actually use for fragmentation, which causes you to uh, miss some of the lower abundance uh, features and causes problems down the way. And the, and the main way that you see this, if you look at your quantification results, is you end up getting these missing values. And when I'm talking about missing values, what I'm, what I'm talking about is in one of the samples, you don't have an area applied to the certain peptide that you're looking at. And if you look at data independent analysis versus DDA analysis, just at this missing value metric, you can see that consistently you're getting far less missing values with DIA than you would be with um, DDA. And this is with a Timstoff, meaning that we're taking a huge number of MS2 scans. So it, it starts to become an issue with actually trying to deal with these missing values. And I'll show this in the actual quantification part, how we can minimize that. All right. so. So this is why it can sometimes be useful to do a DIA analysis. But then the problem with doing DIA analysis, it's a traditional database search becomes extremely difficult with DIA data because you're bringing a whole bunch of different peptides into the MSMS scan at once, which makes a very complex spectrum. And then that it's really hard to actually match a peptide, a single peptide to that complex spectrum that way. So what do you want to do is use a spectral library. So in the new PeaksX Pro, we have a spectral library search, and this is just showing a view of what you would then be working with with a spectral library. So what this brings in is it brings in previously identified spectra, usually, or exclusively with peaks from DDA experiments. So you have previously identified spectra that you can then try to match up to your DIA spectra 
And that makes it a lot easier to get good identification coverage of your DIA experiment. So just to give you some details of what this uh, spectral library is, is you get a whole bunch of these different uh, peptides shown here in this list. So you have a peptide, it's M over Z, charge, and then you get a spectra, which comes from that. And you have this spectral library view where you can click on any of these different uh, peptides and it will show you the library spectra from that. And this is all done in a text format with peaks. So it's a nice small data size. And also you can bring in spectral libraries from different formats and bring those into peaks so that you can do a spectral library search. All right. So let's um, jump into the software demo now. So the, the main data set that I, I'm going to be talking about here today is the Timstoff data set. I have some uh, um, HDMFC and um, thermo data set that we could talk about here as well if you have any questions about that. But just to give you some, some idea of the different features that are useful in Peak, I'm just going to focus here on, on this one. And to show off the ability to deal with complex spectra or complex data sets, uh, this is a pretty standard experiment that is used to test the, the software's ability to deal with um, a quantification experiment where we have three different proteomes. So you shouldn't have very much overlap in terms of the actual identified uh, spectra because they're using human data, uh, yeast data, and E. coli data. And with three different replicates from uh, two different conditions, meaning that we then spike in those proteomes with different ratios. So the human should be about one to one across the two different groups. The yeast should be about a, a three to one, and the E. coli should be in the other direction, a four to one. So I'm gonna show how to actually work with this type of data and use it in peaks. Okay, yeah, so this is the data set here. As so we have our Tim stuff data set and how I've loaded this into Peaks. And this is, when you're, when you're first starting out with Peaks, this is one of the first things that you want to make sure that you're doing right, is you want to make sure that you're loading in the data in a way that uh, uh, Peaks understands. And in that way, so if you go here, file, new project, you start to add your data. I'll just grab, yeah, so, this, so the main point I'm trying to point out here is that you want to add your replicates even if they're from the same condition, you want to add them as separate samples. So you want to click this button here, it says I create a new sample for each file, and then that will add it to different samples here. And that will tell Peaks that these are different samples. So we know what to do when it comes to actually calculating the statistics and seeing if there's reproducibility across those samples, what's actually coming from different samples. If you were to all load this all into a single sample, then it wouldn't be able to give you significant values and that sort of thing in the actual quantification results. So that's one of the important things to highlight here when we're loading in the data. And at this point, you specify the enzyme, the instrument, the fragmentation type, and then the acquisition mode. So I'm going to focus in a little bit here on this acquisition mode because this is one of the trickier parts of these newer versions of Peaks. So if you, this is an important thing to get right because if your data is DIA data and you select DIA data, it's going to be best to use a library search. And if you do a 
de novo sequencing in PeaksDB, which is possible, it's going to take um, a bit more time. Um, one of the things to make sure, if, if it is actually DDA data and then you select DIA data, that's going to make the search take a very long time. So um, that's one thing to just make sure that you get right, is that you always make sure to get the correct acquisition mode um, for your data set to make sure that your results are good, but also to make sure that the search takes a reasonable amount of time for the type of data that you're working with. Yeah, then you can continue on to this workflow section. So this is new to uh, Peaks X Pro. So you have then the choice to go down two paths at this point. You can do your traditional Peaks DB search with the sequence database search, or you can do your library search. The library search is what we recommend if you're working with DIA data. So I'm gonna select this here. Huh. Okay, yeah, that's not gonna work with. Um, yeah, so basically that, if you continue down that road, it's gonna take you through and you can set up your uh, library search parameters and your quantification parameters. But I'll set it up all here in this existing project here. Um, yeah, so, so if you have an existing project, I'm going to be start to work with here from this point on is you can click the top project level here and you can see that the data is all loaded in nicely with these solid green uh, pac-man symbols and click this button here library search and it gets set up your library search with this data so this view is going to be different from what you might expect with a traditional PeaksDB search but the Parameters here are pretty much what you'd expect. You have your precursor error tolerance, fragment error tolerance, ion mobility tolerance. This is going to be specific to the type of ion mobility data that you're loading in. And then you can select your library. So um, the library, when you're configuring that in peaks, you're going to want to bring that in from a DDA data set. So for example, here you can here I have a DDA data set with our traditional PeaksDB result. If you want to uh, create a spectral library, all you have to do is have a PeaksDB result, click export, go spectral library here, and then you just click this button here that says export a, a Peaks library and it will create a, a spectral library from that search result, meaning that it'll take everything that's above a certain 1% FDR rate, and it will then make a spectral library out of that, that that you can then search. And then you can just configure that in Peaks by going to configuration, spectral library, and then I'll load in that export into this list. And then you'll get all the different details of that with the uh, precursor distribution and all that, um, all that nice information here. Yeah, so then you know, set up your library search, set up a actual protein database to get your uh, protein inference out of that. So then you just pick your traditional um, Fast to format database. And then you can just click OK, and it will give you a result that looks like this. So, yeah. So, for anyone that's been using Peaks for a while, a spectral library search might be a little bit unfamiliar to you, but then the, the end, end result of that will be very close to what you'd normally expect. So you get this uh, summary view where you can see the false discovery rate curve and you can set a 1% FDR by coming here to this FDR button, picking a, a FDR cutoff, and then you can continue on through. 
I'll, I'll give you the usual decoy and target hit distributions, your identification rate, and all that useful information, and as well give you the identification rate per sample. And you can see based on, on this type of overlap, what was identified in one sample versus the other, basically a, a, um, a table version of a Venn diagram. And if you have three samples or less, it will create a Venn diagram there. Yeah, so the only difference that you then see here is you get this uh, RT calibration curve. So with, yeah, so I won't get into the details of this uh, because in, in the other web webinars go into a little bit more detail about the library search. But what this, in order to actually get good identifications from a DI data set, it works with the expected retention time of peptides. So what this curve is telling you is whether or not the IRT peptides, meaning the peptides within the sample that we have expected retention time details for, whether or not the expected retention time from the algorithm is matching up with the actual retention time of those peptides. So, all you need to look for with this figure is whether or not you're getting a, a good di distribution along this. So if you're getting this nice distribution where the expected retention time is matching up well with the actual retention time, you know that the algorithm's working according to plan. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the actual result display. All right, so here, I like this one better. All right, so here, here's the feature, the feature tab that I was talking about in the, the slides leading up to the um, software demo here. So this feature tab is, is fairly new and often gets overlooked when you're looking at your peaks results, but there's a lot of useful information here. So what this gives you, if you're dealing with a library result, it's going to show your, your library hits and show you a comparison between your actual raw data and your library hit. But with a traditional database search, you're just going to get um, your traditional database search results here. We're going to be able to see it somewhat like this, where you actually just see the comparison between the actual identified spectrum and the what was actually matched from the theoretical um, fragment lines of that scan. Yeah, so where this view becomes most useful is you can then switch this view to say, you have this feature view filters button here and say, turn off with identification. And you can also say, show the, have a certain area cutoff or quality, which is basically just a, a metric that we built into the software to give you an idea of what the software believes to be a high quality peptide feature. And that's just a, a scale from zero to a hundred or a hundred just being a highest quality peptide feature. And if you turn that on, you'll then be able to see, if you then sort by feature ID, you can start to see that you get peptide features where you don't have an identification at all. And this, you can use this as a way to troubleshoot how much of your actual peptide features you're actually getting able to get an identification from. So you can start to see that you have certain M over Zs where we don't have an identified peptide feature at all. And you can actually see from the LCMS view here that we do have a good quality peptide feature 
and even from your identification. Oop. Seems like that was a lot for it to deal with. If you look at that same view from a traditional database search result, you also have de novo peptides. So what you'll then get is if you're not actually able to get a good database hit from that, it will then give you your de novo peptide from that. So you can then use that to say, okay, why was this good quality de novo result then not matched up by the database search? And then from this view, you can then get everything. So you can then say, turn off with identification. And this is actually um, FAMES data. I'll, just, I'll jump in. So, so this project here is actually a, a FAMES data set where we have different uh, compensation voltages for each sample. And in, in two weeks time, I'll go into this data set a little bit more. I have another webinar coming up talking um, exclusively about FAMES. So you can then uh, toggle which um, compensation voltages you're using. But here I'm just going to show without identification. And then if you then sort by feature ID, so this is basically just going through, let's go by quality. You can then start to see, based on all of that, what peptide features you have an, a database peptide from, which ones you have a de novo peptide from, and which ones you don't have anything at all from. And then from that, it goes back to that whole figure that I was showing off early on. You can get the full details of everything that's identifiable, everything that you can get de novo sequence from, and get an idea of the rate of peptide features that can actually be identified from your data. So yeah, that's what this view is pretty useful for. Um, but then if you don't want to deal with um, all of those details, all, all other th things that you have here, uh, just from your traditional uh, library search here, you have the identified proteins, their coverage, and all of the peptides that match up to that. Uh, click on any of these, and then you can, it'll bring up the best matching library spectrum uh, for that hit. Yeah. And a, a couple other useful features that I wanted to show off here. Um, I'd like to jump in at, so I can double click on any of these peptides. And I'll show you the library match. And then you can right click, and this is with any type of um, result. You can click this show spectrum and LCMS view. I'd like to show off what this does. Um, so if you click this show spectrum and LCMS view, what this will show is it will show this LCMS heat map. And this, you can do this with any of your peptides. And this will actually show you where your identification occurred within the broader story of what's actually going on in this mass spec experiment. So you can see over here on the left, we have our six different samples. And in this case, we're just looking at the fifth one, which had the best identification. And it will then show you where that peptide feature occurs in the M over Z range, which is on the X axis, and the retention time range on the Y axis. And then the intensity of the signal will be the, the how dark the intensity is on, there on the, um, in the actual figure. And what we're actually looking at here, each of these blue squares is an identified MSMS -MS scan 
And then each of the empty blue squares is an unidentified MSMS scan. So that gives you an idea of which of those actual scans was identified or not. And then you can also click look here in the IMS dimension to, since this is Tim stuff data, you can get the same view um, in terms of the IM mobility. Yeah, and that's pretty much all that I had to say about the actual um, identification view. I'd like to actually talk about the quantitative part because with DI data, you're going to want, it, you tend to have the end goal of doing some quantification here. So, we get to the quantification step. This is where you want to set up your quantification parameters. This is, we'd set this up uh, beforehand, but I'm just gonna go through how to set this up here. So if you go back th to the original idea behind this experiment, I'll just review that in the slide here. So what we have, we have some human, we have some yeast, we have some E. coli, and then we have different expected ratios. So samples one, two, and three, we'd expect to have um, one set of ratios, but then in uh, four, five, and six, we've spiked in the E. coli and the yeast at a different concentration. So we'd expect to see one at a three to one ratio and one at a four to one ratio, but in opposite directions. Yeah, and then you just set up your mass air tolerance. Usually you want to match that to your precursor air tolerance from your identification search. Uh, the ion mobility tolerance with Tim stuff data, typically uh, 0 0.05 is what you want to work with. And then new in the, in the latest version of PEAKS is we have the ability to choose whether or not you do retention time alignment. And this, this is an interesting feature because when it comes to IM mobility data, you're dealing with a large amount of peptide features. So if you're going to perform retention time alignment, you get the chance that you might misalign peptide features to something that's not actually the same peptide. Um, so if you then turn this off, you then can potentially increase the accuracy of your results, but then maybe have a negative effect on the sensitivity. So you have the choice to whether or not you're going to perform retention time alignment on that data. And that just comes down to um, a personal preference and um, how you feel about the uh, consistency of the uh, retention time of your peptides from your samples. And then we usually, in the previous versions of PEAKS, you have the ability to choose a retention time shift tolerance. But now in the latest version of PEAKS, it will actually auto-detect that if you, if you choose. And that can have a great impact on the uh, quality of your quantification results. Um, by choosing the narrowest possible retention time window to avoid um, mismatching uh, peptide features from other peptides, to your peptide quantification result. So this will give you the narrowest retention time win window possible to increase the accuracy of your quantification results. And then you select your samples. So samples one, two, and three, group one. Samples four, five, and six, group two. And then you attach your results. And you click OK. And you end up getting a quantification result here. Yeah, so what I'm going to go through here for you today is how I would recommend narrowing down your quantification results to get the most accurate results possible. So here we have the raw quantification results from this data. You can see that we, from the heat map, we don't have a consistent idea of what's being upregulated and downregulated. And we want to figure out what we're actually working with here. So 
first thing that you can do is come in here to the peptide features tab. And I'm gonna go back to the default settings here. So the default ID count is set to one and the have at least so many confident samples is set to one as well. So I'm gonna go through what those uh, parameters mean. So um, the have ID count at one will require that you have an identified MSMS scan in each um, condition for every one of the peptides. And that can be a problem um, if, if you're dealing with a situation where some proteins can be completely turned off in some samples. So this, if the default setting will require that a peptide be identified in one sample of each of the conditions. If that's not what you expect, I recommend that you set that to zero, meaning that you don't have to have an identification in each condition. And then as well, this one here have at least so many confident samples. That means that the peptide must, you must have a peptide feature in each of those. So you'd set that to zero. If you have the, if you want to consider the possibility that some proteins might be completely turned off. All right, and then the next thing I want to come down to here is the quality score and the average abundance. So what you can see here in this quality score distribution, so the quality score is a measure in the software of how reproducible we think that the peptide features are. So you can see at the lower quality scores, you have high, a very high amount of variability across the different um, samples. And you wanna cut those peptides out. You can see that at a certain quality score, you start to lose that variability. So you might wanna say set that to five. And it's a range of zero to 100, much heavier weighted towards the higher end of this scale. So usually setting this to somewhere between two and five will get rid of the really low quality peptide features. And what you'll notice here from this figure is that you start to see our three populations of peptides. So we have our yeast, we have our human and our E. coli starting to appear for us at our higher quality ranges. And you see the same at, in terms of the average abundance. So this is where you start to see what happens with um, quantification results, where lower abundance peptide features, you start to see much higher amount of variability. But then you, at higher abundance, you actually start to see our three different populations. So you can then set a intensity cutoff. And then you apply that. Oh, oh, before I apply that, what I'd like to show you first is this density ratio figure here. So this density ratio plot shows you the density of our actual ratios uh, in, uh, in the sample. So you can see that we just have one big distribution of where we don't actually see all those proteins. But if we then apply these, apply these, filters, All right, yeah, now that we've applied those filters, you can then start to see in our heat map, we're starting to see a group of proteins that's upregulated in one condition and downregulated in the other. And if you look at the density ratio plot, you can start to see now we're actually getting to some uh, reproducible quantification results. We can start to see that we have a true separation of our human, our E. coli, and our yeast here. <clears throat> 
and you can then use this figure to even create a nice uh, distribution here. So you can select your humans, right click, select those all, human, E. coli, and yeast. And you update that, and you can actually start to get, you can get that figure where you can actually see the separation between those different proteomes. And other ways you can start to see this, come here to the protein tab. And this, this is kind of cool, where you can actually look at these protein view filters. Notice here on the right, you can see um, all the, the the heat map here showing all the proteins that are um, significant and uh, downregulated and upregulated, and you can start. It, this is actually interactive, so you can come in here to the protein view filters up here at the top. Let's say we only want to look at the E. coli proteins, type um, some por part of the accession or the description that's going to tell you that. Okay, these are just E. coli proteins. Click OK. And yeah, then you can actually see all the proteins. And you can see that th these proteins are all from E. coli or yeast. That should then switch to, you can see all those yeast proteins here. Yeah, 